Greetings Church, these weeks leading to Christmas is the season traditionally called Advent within the church calendar. The church calendar basically helps us emphasize different areas of discipleship, which is life with God and faith. For example, Lent. In the Lenten season, uh, the time right before Easter, it's a season where we're, we are reminded to rely on God. That's why many will fast during Lent, uh, because Lent reminds us that we rely on God and He's our guiding principle and we want to desire Him and not our appetites. Then there's Easter, right? Easter is when we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. And in this season, we celebrate life uh, and life with Him and, and life together. And so in this season, we feast. After that is Pentecost, which comes right after Easter. It is a season that invites us to be filled with God's life because the Holy Spirit has been poured out and therefore God's presence is with us everywhere and at all times. And now we're in Advent. And Advent calls us to wait on God, especially when life seems dark and hopeless. So as we worship today, let us lean into the spirit of this season, the spirit of Advent, and let us wait on God. Look to Him for wisdom, peace, and hope.
Scandrette and I serve as the Young Life Area Director for San Diego North. Man, can you believe it's almost Christmas? Time has flown by this year and in Young Life that's what we're all about. Time we spend with kids. Now this past year finding ways to spend time with kids in our community was challenging, but our staff and volunteer leaders were still able to connect with, laugh with, and share Jesus with kids through campaigners, special in-home deliveries, and so much more. Now our goal for 2021 is to continue spending time with kids. And the only way we can do that is through generous donors. Now your generosity puts time into our staff and volunteer leader schedule to be with kids. Now if you want to partner with us, you'll see a link to give right below. We hope you'll join us in our work with local students by giving today. Thank you so much and may God bless you this holiday season. In our Advent series, we're in the Old Testament book of Isaiah. Now, Isaiah lived around 700 years before Christ showed up on the scene. And Isaiah has some of the most vivid and beautiful words, prophecies about the coming Messiah. And it is a tradition of the church to look to Isaiah during Advent because in Isaiah's context, well, it's all about waiting, waiting for Christ, the Messiah. And so let me read for us our passage for today in Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 to 9. So if you want to find that in your devices, in your Bibles, uh, this is God's word. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and, and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of the knowledge and fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth, and he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt, and faithfulness the sash around his waist. The wolf will live with the lamb, and the leopard will lie down with the goat. 
the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. Isaiah begins this prophecy with a metaphor. He says, a shoot will come out from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The image here is of a tree that has been so devastated that only a trump remains. Jesse, of course, was the father of King David, so Isaiah is speaking of the Davidic line of kings. Isaiah saw that things were going to get very bad for the people of God, and David's line would decline to such a degree that it would be essentially left for dead like a tree stump. History tells us this is exactly what happened as a result of God's judgment of His people through Assyria and Babylon. Nevertheless, Isaiah also saw that while the Davidic line would seem to be dead, life would remain within the stump. A shoot, life barely detectable at first, would emerge. There there is hope after all. There is good news. And in their waiting, um, God gives them this metaphor to remind them that even in uh, when things seem dim, when things seem hopeless, when things seem so dark, God is at work. There's hope. And we're all waiting, aren't we? 2020, in many ways, is a giant season of Advent, a giant season of waiting. We're waiting for a vaccine, waiting for the elections to be over. I mean, it's, it's been over, but it feels like it's not, right? We're, we're waiting for things to open up, uh, for sanctuaries to be filled as it once was, waiting for some form of normalcy to return, right? Or, or we're waiting for a call back for a job. Some are waiting to give birth. Uh, side note here to our families who are expecting Uh, and do in the next few weeks and months, uh, we're praying for you in this season of waiting. We're all waiting, waiting for God to provide for our needs and waiting for God to break in. And it feels like uh, most of the time as if we're waiting in the dark. But this is where Advent and Christmas is good news. The season of Advent always begins in the dark, but Advent ends with Christmas. For you, life might seem hopeless and even lifeless, like a cut-down tree stump right now. But God says, out of this tree stump, out of this darkness, a a branch of life, a branch of hope, a branch of peace will shoot out. Every year we, we come to this season, we are reminded that darkness is a reality. But the good news of Advent is that God works in the dark. And and, and is this not how God often works? When the future looks so dim, God comes through because this branch, this unexpected, barely detectable life emerges, Christ. The hope of the world comes as a baby, right? Barely detectable to the world's eyes. Had no power in the world's eyes. A baby to a poor family. No influence in the world's eyes. But the answer to the world's deepest longings, the world's... um, darkness, the the world's divisions, the the, the world's sins, the world's brokenness is Jesus. You see, the Hebrews thought that their hope was was in David, King David. Then they realized that he was a failure, and so then they hoped in Solomon. And then Solomon was a failure, and so then the the next king. But it was never David, and it was never any king or any judge or any prophet, but the one whom they pointed to, Jesus. And this is why when Matthew begins to tell the Christmas story, right, Jesus' birth, he he begins with a genealogy and links Jesus to Jesse, to this story. Because the branch of life, this hope from this person where the Spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the Spirit of wisdom and, and of understanding, the Spirit of counsel and of might, the Spirit of the knowledge and fear of the Lord, that's Jesus. It's talking about Jesus. Now look back at verse 4, because how will Jesus bring hope and peace? Well, Isaiah says in verse 4, With righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. At first sight, when when it says that he's going to judge the needy, the way that comes out in the English, um, usually to judge someone means to condemn them. But that's not what it means here. It means he will make things just or right for the needy. He will put put things right. He, He will make the crooked straight. Um, when when it says that he will give decisions for the poor of the earth, again, uh, it it doesn't come out as well in the English. Uh, The word poor is a word that means downtrodden, people without power. Uh, And so uh, to say that he will give decisions for them, what it actually means is 
he's going to stand in their place and exercise his power. He, he's the great equalizer. He, he's going to identify with the poor and give decisions on their behalf and, and use his power to make things right again for them. And this is such an important point. You see, Jesus didn't come to be a civil servant, just another king who will create, uh, come and, and create more social justice. Because look at what the passage, uh, what the rest of the passage says in verse 6. I, I, Isaiah says, The wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. This this poetry is saying that this, this king is not just going to make the world a little bit better because the imagery he gives us in this poem is, is this. The predator and the prey relationship is negated to symbolize the peace of a renewed creation. In verse 8, we didn't read it, but Isaiah says, The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. In the utopian conditions of the Messiah's rule, of Jesus' rule, all dangers of the animal kingdom are removed. Even a child is safe to lead former predators and prey together like domesticated, peaceful animals. In one of the most beautiful descriptions in all of the Bible um, of what life will be like under this king's rule, we see the very nature of the world changed. He, he's, he's going to transform it. What, what he's saying is this king... He will take the earth back to Eden. It's a, it's a picture of full shalom. It's, it's justice. He's going to transform it. He's going to get rid of death. He's going to get rid of disease. He's going to get rid of violence. He's going to get rid of suffering. He's going to make everything right. Shalom. That's justice. And I'm using those words synonymously here. He's going to bring about justice, restoring everything that is broken. And I made this point last week, but I want to unpack it a little bit more because um, it's, it's, a, it's a critical part of the message of Christmas, which is the message of the gospel, which is this. Christmas is about justice. This king is going to care about the poor and identify with the poor, but it's not until Christmas Christmas Day, that we know the lengths to which this king will identify with the poor. Christmas means the Son of God was born into a poor family. Why? Because he cares about justice. His parents, when they went to present Jesus at the temple, they, they, gave, him, or, uh, they gave two birds as a sacrifice. And back in those days, the sacrifice you gave depended on your income. And the poorest families gave two birds. You see, Jesus was born into the poorest of families. And when he ministered, he didn't just preach the gospel. He also fed the hungry, healed the sick, and he raised the dead. This is why the world does not recognize or see Jesus as the hope and answer to the world's ills. Because he didn't lead with theatrics or, or a program or lights and music or rallies or a campaign or, or with power. Christ is the incom incomparably noble and righteous king, the only one who can flawlessly ensure that the least, of all, uh, the, the least of all people receive perfect justice. How? He, ad he identifies with the least of these. He identifies with those in darkness. Remember, God works in the dark, and because He works in the dark, there is no darkness that you are going through or will ever go through that he doesn't understand. And there is no darkness that he will not touch because even in death, this king was willing to go there. And he did go there because God works in the dark. He's a king of true justice, a king of true shalom, a king of true peace. And when Jesus has met you in your darkness, listen, in your injustices, in your hurts, in your loss, when Jesus has met you in your grief, in your sickness, it changes everything. It changes everything. Now, there's application for us here. What does this mean for us? If we desire the Christmas spirit, to be in the Christmas spirit, don't settle for traditions, nostalgia, presents, and time off. Those are all good things. But Christmas is so much more than that. Christmas is so much deeper than that. It means that justice has to be part of our Christmas. Christmas prioritizes justice 
and shalom. Our decision to not gather in person when COVID cases cases started to, to skyrocket or our encouragement to continually to wear masks is a justice-related decision. When, when, we, when we do that, we are participating in shalom. Uh, I feel like this needs to be said, uh, reminded of us, of me, that we're not prioritizing our decisions based on government mandates or anything like that. And I'm not saying that's not important either, but that's not our primary motivation. When we choose not to gather in large groups for, the, for safety reasons, when we choose to wear masks for the sake of others, we're living out justice, we're, we're living out shalom, we're promoting human flourishing. That's our motivation. It's a gospel issue because we're pushing back against death, the potential spread of COVID, and promoting life. That's what justice and shalom is all about, what the gospel is all about, to promote life in, in all the ways that we can and to push back against death in all the ways that we can. And we do that not just in masks. We, we also do that by offering financial help to those who are hurt by the shutdowns because we realize that the closures too have hurt people, hurt businesses. So it's not an either or thing for us. We, we're compelled to promote life and we're compelled to push back against death and darkness in any way that we can. I think this is one of the more fundamental pieces that we're missing as Christians during this season. That we do not see this health crisis as a, as a justice issue or as a gospel issue. I know I haven't, I confess. And, and, and so, I, again, this message is for me. I've fallen short of seeing and treating this as a gospel and justice issue. And I've, and I've fallen short of doing it. And so this is an encouragement and not a condemnation. Because we do this, again, because of what Christ has done for us. Remembering who He is. Because this is not easy, right? And there's, there's so many factors to this. Like for one, I, I know that community and connection is not the same this year for us. And it's a huge value of ours. And we're used to coming together when things are good. Uh, and, and we're used to community around sports, meals, and movies, and playgrounds, and so on, right? But the church... I, have to, I was reminded that the church has always been unified, not primarily because of affinity or traditions. And I'm not saying those are bad things either, but they're not primary. The church is united first and foremost for their need of Jesus and their call to love neighbor, especially to the least of these. United to do justice, to promote human flourishing. You see, the early church that was persecuted was known for doing justice caring for the sick and for the poor. That was their priority, and we are being reminded of that as well. We are in this together because when we do justice, I contend that we are more connected than we have ever have been, and we're connected in a deeper way. Christmas points us in this direction. So for us, in some non-paternalistic, non-patronizing way, we as a church as individuals, need to figure out how to come together and be involved with the lives of the poor, the hurting, the outcast, and the sick. That's physically, financially, emotionally, and relationally. Christmas is about justice, holistic justice, shalom, because God works in the dark. Amen? I want to lead us into a time of prayer. Uh, and uh, I invite your participation. So this prayer will be up on the screen in the text uh, that will be in bold. I invite you to pray that out loud with me. This prayer is entitled um, a, a Liturgy for a Time of Widespread Suffering. And uh, let's pray together. Christ our King, our world is overtaken by unexpected calamity and by a host of attending fears worries and insecurities. We witness suffering, confusion, and hardship multiplied around us, and we find ourselves swept up in these anxieties and troubles, dismayed by so many uncertainties. Now we turn to you, O God, in this season of our common distress. Be merciful, O Christ, to those who suffer, to those who worry, to those who grieve, to those who are threatened or harmed in any way by this upheaval. Let your holy compassions be active throughout the world, even now, tending the afflicted, comforting the brokenhearted, and bringing hope to many who are hopeless. 
Use even these hardships to woo our hearts near to you, O God. Father, empower your children to live as your children. In times of distress, let us respond not as those who would instinctively entrench for our own self-preservation, but rather as those who, in imitation of their Lord, would move in humble obedience toward the needs and hurts of their neighbors, of their neighborhoods and communities. You were not ashamed to share in our sufferings, Jesus. Let us now be willing to share in yours, serving as your visible witnesses in this broken world. Hear now these words, you children of God, and be greatly encouraged. The Lord's throne in heaven is yet occupied. His rule is eternal and His goodness and His good purposes on earth will be forever accomplished. So we need never be swayed by the brief and passing panics of this age. You are the King of the ages, O Christ, and history is held in your Father's hands. We, your people, know the good and glorious end of this story. Our heavenly hope is secure. In this time of widespread suffering, then, let us rest afresh in the surpassing peace of that vision that your whole church on earth might be liberated to love more generously and sacrificially. Now labor in and through us, O oh Lord, extending and multiplying the many expressions of your mercy. Amen. And to end our time together, let me close with this blessing, with this benediction. Risen family, rejoice, aim for restoration, comfort one another, agree with one another, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Amen.